Laureate, seminar speakers, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all from different parts of the world to the Nils Klim seminar in honor of the 2021 Nils Klim Laureate, Dr. Daria Lysenko from the University of Helsinki. My name is Kjersti Fröttum. I'm the chair of the Holberg Board, who annually awards the Nils Klim Prize to outstanding young scholars from the Nordic countries. In the humanities, social sciences, law and theology. And if there were no pandemic, the Norwegian government and the Holberg Prize would welcome you and the laureate to a week of celebrations in Bergen in early June. This was not possible last year, nor is it possible this year, due to the entry restrictions that we still follow from the pandemic. Thus, the Nils Klim seminar will take place as a hybrid digital live event this year, with the laureate and the seminar speakers on video link from Helsinki, Stockholm, and Trondheim, whereas I am present here, together with Professor Hovard Horsta in the University of Ola in Bergen, from where the event is being live streamed. Hovard Horsta is Professor of Human Geography and Director of the Center for Climate and Energy Transformation at the University of Bergen. Now, for the Linz Klim Seminar, the laureate is asked to propose a topic as well as the persons with whom she would like to converse. And we look very much forward to taking part in the presentations and the discussions during this year's Nils Klim seminar, in honor of Daria Grisenko, who has chosen the very interesting and relevant topic for today's society for her seminar, Aligning Digitalization and Sustainability. To present the laureate and the seminar speakers, I hereby give the floor to Professor Hovar Horsta, who will be moderating the event. So please, Hovar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kjersti. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the Nils Klim Prize Seminar, where we have the opportunity to debate a really timely and critical challenge uh, for society. How can we align digitalization with sustainability. What kind of governance do we need to align the digital disruption with uh, sustainability challenges? Digitalization holds the potential to help us with uh, the challenges of sustainability. But the negative effects of digit digital technology on individuals, on institutions, on society and nature complicate this picture. To benefit from digitalization and to ensure our collective well-being within planetary boundaries, we need political will and we need collective action that bring sustainability to the forefront. This seminar builds on the work and ideas uh, of this year's um, Nils Klim uh, laureate, Daria Gertsenko who is with us from uh, Helsinki. Of course, we would have loved to have um, you, Daria, um, with us here in Bergen, but um, for reasons that we are all pa painfully aware of now, uh, that's uh, simply not possible. But we will manage by video link. Gritsenko is Assistant Professor of uh, R Russian and Eurasian Studies at the University of Helsinki. She holds a PhD in social science uh, and the title of docent in uh, environmental policy. Her research focuses on governance dynamics in response to changing natural and environmental environments. Gitsenko is awarded the Nils Klim Prize in 2021 for her, her outstanding research contributions at the intersection of political science, environmental studies and digital humanities. In this seminar today, we will first hear Gitsenko introduce the topic of the debate uh, and identify some key governance problems that digitalization brings. 
Then we will have two invited guest speakers, Victor Galance and Marianne Righeg, who I will introduce in course, um, to offer their perspectives. After these presentations, we'll have a chance uh, to debate and take questions, which I'm really looking forward to. But before we get that far, um, I will give the virtual floor to Daria Gritsenko. Dear colleagues and friends, this is a great honor and a privilege for me to be speaking in this seminar today and have a discussion with two world-renowned Nordic experts in the field of sustainability transformations, Marianne and Victor. Thank you so much for accepting this invitation. It's a great pleasure and I hope we'll have a good time today. I was very excited when I got to know that as a part of the Niels Klim Prize Celebration Activity, I can choose any topic and invite any scholar to discuss it with me. What a unique opportunity to learn, to sharpen my own thinking and to challenge my ideas. This is why I decided to propose a topic that I am not all that familiar with. I just started looking into it about a year ago and now I'm in an early stage of a book project. Hence, I will now provide a short introduction and then give the floor to the more accomplished experts eagerly waiting for the discussion part. So the topic that I want to address today has gained increasing attention in the past few years. Sustainability in the digital age. In July 2018, so just three years ago, Secretary General of the United Nations appointed a high-level panel co-chaired by Melinda Gates and Jack Ma to consider the question of, I quote, digital cooperation, the ways we work together to address the social, ethical, legal and economic impacts of digital technologies in order to maximize their benefits and minimize their harm which resulted in a milestone report, The Age of Digital Interdependence, published in 2019, and the Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, issued in 2020, looking at the issue specifically in the light of Sustainable Development Goals. At the same time, the EU Council sought alignment between the European Green Deal and the EU's digital strategy through the digitalization for the benefit of the environment program, as well as non-governmental organizations and global partnerships have been emerging around the same topic, prominently the Future Earth Sustainability in the Digital Age Initiative and the Coalition for Digital Environmental Sustainability. As we can see, uh, the high-level engagement with the topic is quite recent. But on the other hand, it seems like a common place to say we live in the age of digital transformation or even digital revolution. This narrative is by now well established in most parts of the world, especially here in the Nordics. In this narrative, digital transformation denotes rapid development of digital technologies, the World Wide Web, the Internet of Things, devices, uh, artificial intelligence, and whatever there is yet to come, and their application across all sectors of society that has consequences for how we understand ourselves as individuals and how we act as a society. It has an impact on our economy, on our social environment, and on the natural environment the three classical sustainability pillars. Steering digital transformation towards sustainability is therefore an emerging big topic. Yet, there is no common understanding nor an explicit model for governance aligning digitalization and sustainability. We don't have an, even a term that we commonly use. Current terminological variety, including digital cooperation, sustainable digitalization, digital environmental sustainability, and other variation, including these two words, in my opinion, they are just another indication that we are lacking a governance image. To sum up, on the one hand, we have this great and terrible digital technology, and on the other hand, we acknowledge sustainability as a developmental imperative. And we even have sustainable development goals as the world consensus regarding where we want to be. What we don't have is an understanding of the process that links the two. What is it now? What it could be? And what it should be? 
In my presentation today, I will argue that we should consider a shift in our thinking from governance of digital technology to governance of the digital environment. Once we consider digital as an environment, we can not only address the notorious pacing problem, meaning that technology evolves faster than regulatory ability to keep up, but also benefit from the expertise accumulated through 30 years of research and practice in environmental governance. The remaining time I will spend proceeding in three moves that explain why the governance focus should change in order to successfully link digitalization and sustainability. Let's start with digital technology. Digital technology essentially means a technology that relies on binary coded data. The development of binary code radically simplified information and communication, creating new possibilities of convergence between a great variety of technologies, contents and formats. With history spanning over several centuries, the starting point of digitalization as we know it today is usually considered to be the publication of Shannon's seminal paper in 1948, followed by a variety of applications, digital databases, digital watch, photo camera, and of course, the World Wide Web, publicly available since 1991. A variety of different metrics has been used to prove the growing importance of digital transformation including the amount of uh, information stored digitally, the proportion of population online, the money spent in e-commerce. But maybe one and the most important characteristic is the cultural transformation, since artifacts providing instant connection to the online world have become a lifeline for our daily activities, defining how we think about ourselves and how we relate to each other. In the early days of what I would call mass digitalization, so the mid-late 90s to mid-2000s, we thought of digitalization as a great promise for a better future. Digitalization was expected to bring efficiency and speed to businesses, help them optimize their processes and grow. The electronic government initiatives were launched as an absolutely new way of serving the public, uh, being user-centric and uh, more oriented towards the user, customer, citizen. Most prominently, the internet was seen as the liberation technology that enables people to express opinion, mobilize protest, and realize various freedoms, even in unfree societies, because it provides free access to information and new ways of connectivity. We also expected nature-saving effects of online communication and transactions. In short, more efficiency, less waste, more connectivity, less ignorance, more opportunities for everyone. I call this the stage one thinking, following the techno-optimism tradition. Drawing a parallel with the famous technology hype cycle, from this peak of inflated expectations, we fell into the trough of disillusionment. The burst of the dot-com bubble in the early 2000s was the first major event in this spectacular shift in our attitude towards digitalization. It turned out that the way we use digitalization often causes harm. We use rare and non-renewable resources to produce hardware, we create techno trash, and we need a never-increasing amount of energy to run our digital universe. We realized that we pay a dear price for increased efficiency, surveillance, data capitalism, mental health issues, all while engaging into a gig economy and marching into the jobless future where a few tech giants will decide how the world would look like. In the popular culture, the British Black Mirror TV series from 12, 2011 nicely summarizes this dystopian stage two thinking, which follows the techno pessimist tradition. Though the assessment of the ways how digitalization and sustainability intersect is opposite in these two views, they share one premise. That's the premise of technological determinism. Up until very recently, and to some extent we hear the echo of this thinking today, technological determinism was the leading voice in popular discourse. In short, media and popular culture repeatedly claim that technology determines society's culture, values, social structure and history. Technology is thought of as a key governing force in society. 
And this obviously creates a problem, a governance problem. We need to govern this technology in order to minimize its harmful effects, but it seems like there is not much we can do as this technology is completely defining us and our life. In particular, with emerging technologies, we face the so-called pacing problem. We are in a race where we can never catch up as technology develops faster than regulation and thereby yields regulatory governance obsolete. One important thing that is happening right now, in my opinion, and is evidenced in the policy trends that I presented at the beginning of my talk, is that popular discourse starts to gradually adapt the social construction thinking thinking that has been the mainstream way of understanding society technology interaction in academia for a couple of decades already, particularly in science and technology studies. This thinking holds that the path of technological development and its consequences for society are shaped by society itself through the influence of culture, politics, economic arrangements and the like. What comes out of this important discursive shift is the what I call stage three thinking, thinking of sustainability and digitalization together, where sustainability is thought of as a normative goal and digitalization as the means to attain that goal through proactive steering, read governance. And as I claimed at the beginning of my talk, this is where we are stuck as we do not have a model for such governance. Or maybe we do. Let us now focus on this stage three thinking. I will read you now a few sentences from the UN documents, as I think they are very revealing. So the first quote, digital technologies are rapidly transforming society. And as technological change has accelerated, the mechanisms for cooperation and governance of this landscape have failed to keep pace. The next quote. This is a divergent approaches and ad hoc responses threaten to fragment the interconnectedness that defines the digital age, leading to competing standards and approaches, lessening trust and discouraging cooperation. And the last quote. This is not something any country, company or institution can achieve alone. When I hear this, it rings a bell. I think I've heard it, pretty much the exact same words. And this is what I call the language of global challenges. In short, we use the same language to talk about digitalization challenges as we use in climate and biodiversity discussions. We talk about complex, wicked, transboundary problems, but we do not use the same approach to governance. There is also a solid diagnostic of governance gaps in the UN report, identifying six major gaps. I'm not going to go into that, but if we would analyze these statements, we would be able to map them upon the discussions we had in environmental governance already since the 80s. And experts in environmental policy and governance would recognize those. High versus low politics, institutional complexity, integration challenge, evidence challenge, lack of trust. So we have quite a bit of understanding, but governance practice falls short. Why? I will argue this is because so far we have been focusing on technology governance. Technology governance presupposes that technology is the object of governance, that we need to regulate technologies, and this will somehow translate into improved social practices surrounding these technologies. But what if the opposite is true? What if we need to aim at social practices to repair technologies? This brings me to the concluding part of my talk. I propose a concept of digital environment governance as a continuation and extension of the natural environment governance. Natural environment governance means steering and regulating human access to, use of, and impacts on the environment. Notice that the object of governance is not nature, but rather us and our interaction with nature. By the same token, in digital environment governance, we should aim at steering individual and co collective action towards desirable public goods and societal outcomes. And you may say it's not feasible, we can't tell people, for example, how they should behave online. But it also felt impossible to address many practices harmful to nature, such as street littering or ocean damping or deforestation. But by combining hard law, behavioral nudges and market-based instruments, we have come a long way to see improved outcomes. 
if we would agree that we need the shift of governance, it would, of course, not solve all the problems instantaneously. But it would supply large amount of customizable solutions. We could draw on the principles of environmental governance, such as precautionary, polluter pays, common but differentiated responsibilities, just to name a few. We could draw on the evidence related to polycentric and adaptive governance approaches. We could reframe our ethical concerns and regulatory practices. So I argue that we could achieve better results by redefining our living environment as nature plus digital, with interconnected flows and is installing comprehensive governance to address our living environment in a holistic manner. Summing up. There is a lot of work to be done to align sustainability and digitalization. But we do not have to start from scratch. If we would extend the solutions that have worked in relation to the natural environment to the digital environment, capitalizing on existing knowledge and experimenting with its creative application. In short, there is hope and working together, we can create a better future for everyone. Thank you. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Daria. <clears throat> there, indeed, there's lots of work to be done. Um, thank you for, for contextualizing this deb debate for us uh, in, a such clear, in, in such a clear way. Now I look forward to hearing from our first uh, invited guest speaker, uh, Victor Galas. He is Associate Professor of Political Science. Uh, and also the Deputy Director of the Stockholm Resilience Center at, the, at uh, Stockholm University. His research explores the uh, political and governance challenges created by rapid global change, including uh, its sustainability implications. With colleagues at uh, the Stockholm Resilience Center, he has developed groundbreaking work on governance and complexity in the face of sustainability uh, challenges. Today, he will speak to us uh, about sustainability in the era of dark machines. Victor, the digital floor is yours. Thank you so much for the kind invitation. I hope you hear me okay. Um, and, and thank you so much to Dr. Vitsenko for bringing these very important issues to the table. Um, I have one presentation. There it is. Thank you. I'm trying to figure out how to click it if I want to move forward. Or I, I, maybe I can just say next slide. If that, oh, there I see, sorry. Um, so again, thanks. I mean, this is a really important topic. I think, I think digitalization, artificial intelligence is going to be one of the main challenges for sustainability uh, in the near future. And I think we're really not grasping those challenges today. So I'm going to give you my overview of how I see the, the big topics uh, evolving. One useful way to think about it is, as I see it, first of all, we're living on this planet and this planet hosts something that we call the biosphere. So that's the living planet, biodiversity, living oceans, a stable climate, etc. Without that biosphere, we're actually nothing more than a dead rock floating around in space. And I think that's incredibly important to recognize. On top of this biosphere, we've built the technosphere, and that is what we're talking about today. So not just the digital, but the, the, the very hard infrastructure that, that dominates the planet in the Anthropocene. One important aspect and observation in this context, and that, that's why I think this type of work that you're doing uh, at the moment on digitalization and technology is so important, is that the technosphere is massive. So, so the technosphere at the moment weighs around 30 trillion tons. That's 12 zeros, if I uh, uh, calculate this correctly. So if you spread that out over the land, first, uh, land surface of the planet, that's 50 kilos of, of technology on each square meter of the planet currently. And what is fascinating now, and, and why I think digitalization, artificial intelligence, automation, etc., is becoming so uh, important, is that this technosphere is no longer just dead mass. It's becoming increasingly what some people call cognitive. It, it measures, it senses, it nudges, it, it analyzes, it communicates with us and communicates with, with each other in that technology. And that makes it increasingly important to understand how is this new technosphere, this machine intelligent 
sensing technosphere evolving and where is politics in that um, one thing that I, I want to acknowledge and I think is it, again just to add of the importance of the, the question is the fact that the pandemic has actually seems to be accelerating uh, the trends towards digitization, um, both in, in farming but, but in other uh, sectors where actually uh, companies discovered that they were vulnerable to the fragilities of humans. Uh, and then, of course, in the economic recovery after the pandemic, the ambitions to create a, a climate safe world at the same time as you boost digitization and artificial intelligence being one part of this digitization journey as the European Green Deal uh, exemplifies. And of course, if we look even bigger and we look into nations and how they are investing in looking into digitization and artificial intelli intelligence almost as an arms race, right? So we've seen announcements by the UK, Germany, France, United States, uh, particularly the United States, making sure or communicating that we're not going to let China take the lead here. We, we're going to compete on that. Canada as well. And then, of course, China uh, with digitization and AI being one explicit part of the five-year plan. And what I think is important to recognize is that people normally would think about things like uh, artificial intelligence in this sense, like AlphaGo, uh, beating uh, a deep learning system, AI system that, that bet uh, the, the, with the world champion in Go, right? That's normally how we think about artificial intelligence. But in fact, artificial intelligence in the context of sustainability is something that will hit everything. So it will be broad, the impact will be broad. So in many sectors, if not all sectors, finance, social media, energy, transport, uh, climate modeling, etc. It will be ubiquitous, which is a complex word, but one way to translate it is that it will be almost an invisible infusion in technologies today. You probably don't think about it, but just think about your smartphone and think about the applications in the, art, in the smartphone that started with very simple algorithmic systems, now suddenly start to use deep learning algorithms with you not even thinking about it. So they become infused in technologies. And then the last point that I think is important, that the impacts will be deep. So, so digitization, artificial intelligence is already now shaping our perceptions, for example, through social media, our memories also through social media, and even our emotional world. Um, I would love to elaborate that further, but I'm not going to do that for the purpose of time. So just for me to remember that when we talk about the digital, when we talk about artificial intelligence, to not get too stuck into things like this. And I think this is a great project. So it's called Code Carbon. So it allows you to measure the carbon impact of the code that you're developing. And I think that's good, but that's a very narrow way to look at the impacts of digitization and artificial intelligence for sustainability in our world. It would always be like if we were back in 2004 and then looked at Facebook the birth of Facebook and social media, and then the only thing we would worry about would be the carbon footprint of Facebook and social media, which we know is not the biggest challenge created by Facebook and social media. I mean, the, the impacts are much more complex and much bigger, and, and that needs to be acknowledged. So in the end, what happens now, and I, this is why I really appreciate the work and the discussion here, is that technology becomes politics, right? So this is a very typical classical definition of politics by Harold Laswell, politics is who gets what, when, and how. And it's unavoidable from a social science point of view to think about digitization and artificial intelligence as vehicles for politics. And that's why governance becomes so, so important in this context. I speak of, of dark machines. Um, and I'm going to define that a little bit. Um, so, so to me, I mean, dark machines have a number of properties. And I think, first of all, the advanced AI systems that we're seeing now that are real, that perform very well compared to older algorithmic systems have limited transparency. It's just in, in the way they're set up, in the way these neural networks operate. The other aspect is that when artificial intelligence, digitization, automation, Internet of Things 
become intermixed and fused over time, you're creating a very complex system. It's a, it, you can, some people think about it as a complex adaptive system. And that system also has limited predictability because of so many connections. And then the last point is, of course, and something that we have experienced, that these technologies, digitization, artificial intelligence, can be used and have been used for dark purposes. There's a term called, for example, uh, dark patterns for, for manipulation online to have people consume certain things online. Uh, there's, there's some very interesting work uh, exploring the hidden work behind AI system called, called ghost work people cleaning and filtering manually in databases to make AI work. And then, of course, in the last, uh, and energy consumption, mineral consumption, and, of course, dark intentions and negative impacts of these systems on people and planet. So th that's why I think that dark machines is something that we need to think about, unpack, and govern in, in, a, in a serious way. Uh, so how this all relates to sustainability, of course, you can do a lot of marvelous things with with artificial intelligence and digitization for sustainability. I'm not going to dwell too much uh, on that. I think this is a, my personal summary of, of Marcus Reichstein's work that was published in Nature. So essentially AI systems that allows you to classify images of cats and dogs and does that quickly or uh, allows you to overcome uh, spar uh, sparse data uh, or allows you to predict what's going to happen in a video can be used for climate and sustainability purposes. So detect extreme weather events very rapidly and with precision that we haven't seen before. Uh, you can use similar algorithms to bridge data gaps, to downscale climate models. And of course, you can use those types of AI systems to predict climate change um, in ways that you couldn't do before. Let's see here. But there are some very tangible risks. I'm just going to mention them very, very briefly that I think algorithmic governance uh, is needed and is needed urgently. First of all, there is a digital divide for these technologies. There's always been a digital divide that has been, gap has been closing for some technologies, for example, mobile technologies. But for more advanced systems, AI system, that, that gap is massive. Uh, another thing that we know about these AI systems is that they're quite powerful, they can do a lot of things, but they also have biases. They have biases against women, people of color, they're fragile, they can be hacked, manipulated. And the last point that I think is important, I'm just going to mention that very briefly from a sustainability point of view, that once these technologies touch down on the ground, if we talk about digital farming or forestry, they are actually designed to maximize output and that tends to create very fragile ecosystems uh, that, that's an insight that ecologists have communicated for decades that we need to take seriously um, so if you consider something like digital farming for example these are expensive technologies that require a lot of data a lot of skills you need that capital investment will only be uh, give you a good return if you have big operate at big scales and maybe even at monoculture level. And that creates more fragile ecosystems. So that's, that's a risk. There's no strong empirical evidence, but this is something that we need to take seriously, I believe. And then the last point, uh, building on my colleagues' work, is that there are many things that allow us to steward living ecosystems uh, in ways that is resilient. And a lot of that is related to things like local ecological knowledge or a sense of place, connections between people and nature. And I don't see those values and that critical source of resilience being embedded in these technologies at the, at the moment. These technologies are designed to optimize, maximize, uh, not uh, help us steward uh, the living planet. So in a sense, just to wrap up, I think what we need to be careful with, and that's why we need governance and talk about governance, is the fact that we're in a phase of rapid climate change, we're in a phase of rapid planetary change, and there will be a push to develop technologies to help us cope and navigate this in a better way. The problem is, of course, if we design these technologies in irresponsible ways that accelerate 
resource extraction and contribute to social inequality at the same time. So to me, there is an opportunity, and this is where politics is needed and governance is needed, to change this feedback, to really direct where technology is heading and make sure that it's responsible both for people and planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor, for reminding us of these uh, dark sides and risks involved in uh, digitalization and also some possibilities for, 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 for governance. Our second guest speaker is Professor Marianne Rygghaug. She's Professor of Science and Technology Studies at the uh, Norwegian University of Science and Technology, NTNU, in Tonia. She leads the Center for Energy, Climate and Environment. Currently, her research focuses on socio-technical transitions in particular in the areas of smart grids, smart homes, transport, electric vehicles, and sustainable mobility. She is particularly interested in the interface between public participation and engagement, which is, I think is a, th a theme that we will uh, spend some time on uh, today in relation to technology and digitalization. And today um, we will hear from her with a presentation on governing emerg emerging technologies and enacting futures towards transitions to a sustainable world. Marianne, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. So first, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here and uh, to listen to the two fascinating talks before me. Uh, I look very much forward to our discussions afterwards and uh, to follow your work, uh, Daria, in the future. It seems like a very interesting book project you have going on. Um, personally, I've worked more, mostly uh, with the digitalization in the energy sector and more lately in the transport sector. And uh, I think, uh, as you mentioned also, Daria, only recently I've been... Uh, uh, I think there's only recently been these discussions about uh, digitalization and seeing this uh, much connected to the sustainability um, discourse. Uh, so I also, in a way, feel like a newcomer in the field, even though I've been in this area for some time. And uh, I feel that this topic was a real challenge to bring those uh, discussions uh, into conversation. And I really agree that it's really necessary that we talk more about how to govern uh, this, uh, the digital uh, uh, systems in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So I will start by repeating uh, a bit of the evidence, but yet a really important message that today the globe is suffering from grand sustainability challenges as, such as climate change, degradation of ecosystems and waste production and poverty, and that the global initiative to target sustainability development goals and the Paris Agreement underlies the urgency of these challenges and the need to transform our societies in a more sustainable direction. And as a response to these challenges, an explicit focus on sustainability transitions has emerged as a way of understanding understanding and engaging with the challenges of climate change and sustainability. And such perspectives have on the one hand been aimed at understanding the dynamics of transitions that have already unfolded in the past, but on the other hand, uh, cultivating the normative and interventionist agendas aimed at understanding how to bring about uh, contemporary and future transitions. And uh, if you look at how we define sustainability transitions, tr sustainability transitions are funda fundamental changes in socio-technical systems such as energy, food and transport that aim to address grand challenges in a way that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability to future generations to meet. The role of sustainability transitions research in this have been to study how radical innovations emerge, struggle with incumbent interests, and eventually lead to major system changes. Technological change has been viewed as a core element in these socio-technical uh, system changes. However, to address, uh, if you can go to the next, please. 
the urgency of the uh, if we address the ur urgency of the grant sustainability challenges, transition scholars have argued that we need to enter a new phase in which emerging innovations accelerate and contribute to broader system transformations. So far, the focus has been on technology and innovations that that uh, often has become uh, innovated uh, in specific niches, local niches. But now it's argued that there is a need to accelerate sustainability transitions so that they are getting wider in scope and uh, that they also encompass more geographically and that they also encompass more and more parts of other systems. Uh, other energy and transport systems. So such a widening scope uh, also requires changes in policy, business and consumer practices, uh, as already mentioned. Um, so if you look at the, just to remind us a little bit, what are the structural changes in the energy system that are made possible by digital tools? Maybe you have seen this picture before. Um, uh, where we can see how the, we are going from, from a system uh, to the left, uh, which uh, where you have centralized power plants and markets on the left side, and uh, to a new system with many small producers and more decentralized markets on the right. And in these new systems, distribution is no longer going to going one way top down, but you, they are also going in both directions. And consumers are no longer playing uh, a passive role, they have more active roles uh, participating in the energy system. We can also see uh, moving from supporting particular technology oriented trajectories to system wide transformations. This includes more sectors and multiple systems and that this transition will be much more challenging th than what we've previously seen. And uh, yeah, it's much more challenging than just supporting uh, singular technologies like EVs and solar PV, for instance. So first, uh, acceleration through widening system transformation will, for instance, be dependent on and related to developments and interaction with other systems, such as development within, uh, ICT sec within the ICT sector. And there is, of course, also the need to, to, to complementarity to, to develop this, uh, these systems in synchronization more or less. And secondly, more inter interaction between the multiple systems uh, also challenge coordination in policy and governance. Policymakers will have to scrutinize the progress in rapidly diffusion innovations, stimulate developments in other innovation areas that is needed, and uh, in order to prevent halts in uh, transition activities. But at the same time, they need to govern these transitions in, uh, in ways that do not compromise other important parameters uh, so, that we are, so, so that we are going towards sustainability within the boundaries of the Earth such, uh, and paying attention to, to parameters such as ecology and justice, as just mentioned. Uh, digital t technology and the ongoing digitalization of society, uh, we know, can have many effects, both positive and negative, uh, especially seen from a sustainability perspective. On the one hand, digitalization is needed, and in many sectors, it's an enabler for sustainability transitions to happen, as already mentioned above uh, in the previous slides. And it plays, uh, no doubt, an enabling technology within energy efficiency and developments of smart homes. And it's also seen as a key to control and coordinate the use of energy through so-called smart grids and flexibility markets. And it's also important for electrifying transport and linking the different sectors together, such as energy and transport uh, sector. If you look a bit deeper into one sector uh, where digitalization is happening really, really fast, uh, we see this in the, in the, especially where digitalization is used for coordination support, uh, purposes in the, in the transport sector, and uh, where 
this coordination is used for real-time matching of supply and demand. And uh, some some uh, examples of this we find uh, where we have shared cars and b bikes and e-scooters. The typical are taxi and ride hailing services and the consumer delivery services. And uh, another service is is the smart EV sharing and vehicle to grid uh, kind of of uh, services. If we look at ride hailing, then as one of the examples uh, I mentioned, this has had a massive growth uh, in the world since the development of these platform-based technologies. And of course, you're familiar with Uber and DD, uh, which is the Asian counterpart. And on the positive side, it has, of course, the potential to to be more efficient and to to connect uh, ride, rider and driver more efficiently than the typical waving in the streets, uh, street hailing. But it also has other consequences and more negative con consequences as well. First, uh, it's very unclear how many uh, car trips uh, ride hailing, uh, how many uh, uh, car trips they replace. And uh, it's also very unclear how ride hailing substitution effects on public transport is, is paying out. It's uh, uh, new evidence is, is uh, uh, is going towards that uh, ride hailing uh, substitute to a quite large extent public transport. And of course, that's not something that we want. And it's also uh, promoting motorized traffic and congestions. And uh, it has a lot of negative effects on the environment and energy consumption. And uh, it also has a scarcity of business uh, models that work well, as very few operators that make large profits, and most are not willing to accept lower profits uh, margins. And this, especially not to accept lower pro profit margins, so that disadvantaged groups and areas uh, are uh, are um, going to take uh, an advantage of these kind of services. So there is also stark uh, social and spatial inequalities uh, in availability and use uh, concern with it. And one example uh, of this is related to a major concern uh, uh, that we've seen around safety of female users of, uh, when using this kind of services. You have probably heard about this uh, stories about female uh, riders being using these services, as there were two women that were murdered using the DD carpooling service Hitch. And this led many users in China to boycotting this, this kind of services. While there have not been many of this, uh, just a handful of these reports, and it's argued that standard taxes aren't as safe as well, uh, there is a sense among consumers that they need to be better protected. Uh, as these quotes from the interviews uh, conducted by one of my PhDs uh, have confirmed. In the future, uh, blockchain is by some thought to integrate with ride hailing technology to ensure greater screening measures and, of drivers and to higher security standards. And another future expectation is, of course, that ride hailing uh, will be autonomous which takes the question of the rider uh, out of the equation altogether, which some would argue uh, will, will advance the safety of uh, ride hailing. Autom autonomous vehicles, however, um, also raise a number of concerns. To the right uh, in the picture, you see a visualization of the Society for Autonomous automotive engineers, uh, the, the levels of automation that they use. And this has been increasingly used as the standard for making sense of differences in vehicle automation. And this is based on conventional Euro-American modernist liberal understandings of human subjects as ontologically separated from and a priori to technological objects. Uh, 
And it's also very in instrumentalist and functionalist, resulting in driving tasks being understood as transferable from one entity to another. While it's not explicit in the SAE levels, the assumption usually is that machines are better at driving than humans. They don't get bored, they don't get distracted or tired, and are therefore much less error prone. Uh, especially if automated vehicles are connected and thus can communicate with immediate environments and be equipped with latest information and changes to decision-making algorithms. And this is, of course, correct in one sense. Vehicle automation can empower transformations away from the hegemony of individually owned vehicles, conventional vehicles, towards more collective, sustainable mobility system in which cars and vans are not the default mode, but supplementary to other forms of transport. However, the expectations about fully automated autonomous vehicles are highly ex exaggerated and overlook important ramifications. Some of which, uh, some of these ramifications we have uh, studied in a project of ours that is called Drivers on the Digitalization of the Road Transport. Transport with an S, I can see. <laughs> And uh, as we see so in the previous slide, uh, visions of high-level automation contains vehicles that work anywhere without human interference. However, our studies show that test size and pra practical innovation within intelligent transport systems tends to be very high, very place-specific. By studying autonomous buses in the Stavanger region in Norway and uh, a site for testing intelligent transport systems in the Arctic region near the Finnish border, we are able to point out not only technological flaws, usually ignored in the discussion of the future AVs, uh, such as the placelessness uh, embedded in visions of uh, full automat automated vehicles, but another point worth mentioning is the way AVs and ITS technologies will have to rely on webs of social and technological connectivity and require vast investments in infrastructures and communication networks in order to function properly. And this may, means that not all places in the world would have the same capability to develop, develop these required infrastructures. Thus, we see pertinent ch challenges related to both the scalability of these systems and, again, Justin's concerns. And this also relates to a second point that I do not have time to go into in detail, but we clearly see how these kind of projects, pilots and uh, test sites uh, are and can be tools of governance that uh, channel resources and give legitimacy to specific actors and specific goals and futures. Next, please. So going back to, to digitalization and sustainable mobility, uh, we see that it's often reduced to environmental sustainable transport, typically low carbon and little or no pollution. However, sustainable mobility is just as attentive to the unequal ways in which the human and the technologies are, are folded into and entangled with each other. So this is a key for thinking about uh, mobility because by and large digitalization has done little to reduce the inequalities in actual mobility practices and experiences and, and in the potential to be or become mobile. And this is also why uh, in which digital te technologies, datafication and automation are co-constituting actual and potential mobility. Uh, and this is also something that has been a major concern for scholars and activists interested in transport and mobility. And I would say the same goes for the, for the energy sector for, to a large extent. So to sum up, uh, on uh, your screen you will see uh, a simple depiction of how we can begin to understand what digitalization in transport is changing. And I would claim that this picture also is relevant for other sectors such as energy. Dig digitalization is generating more, more differentiated and more com complex effects, some of which can, be, can make energy and transport more sustainable and others much less so. So 
We can see these three aspects in particular that we should keep an eye on, the datification, the algorithmization and the automation. And the change is their approach to the five C's to the right. Um, to, and uh, this cut across the constituent elements of mobility systems. And I think it, it goes quite well for the energy systems as well and other systems, uh, including service provision and operation, business models, governance, practices and experiences. So this offers a kind of partial heuristics and descriptive framework for thinking about the myriad effects of digitalization in, in transport and um, probably many other sectors. So if I go to the conclusion then, um, aligning digitalization and sustainability in our digital uh, technology and the ongoing digitalization of society can have diverse implications as we have seen from a sustainability perspective. However, it's very difficult to predict uh, what types of impacts new technologies and services can lead to and the overall consequences of them. And in the beginning of my talk, I stressed the need for accelerated sustainability transitions and system-wide transformations in multiple sectors. And the way, way acceleration uh, may complicate coordination and governance of these systems. And this means it becomes important to an, an, an important policy challenge to manage possible trajectories and navigate how to prevent or reach these possible futures. So it's therefore important that we constantly ask how we may ensure that transitions enable and, and co-produced with digitalization are made to be just fair and more humane. Acknowledging that transformative uh, change cannot be achieved without transforming how we look at problems also entails a focus on building capacity for anticipatory governance and scientific practices that tend to such concerns. There is, in my view, no simple answer for how this uh, may be achieved. However, I do think we need to develop this kind of uh, interdisciplinary and critical perspectives further uh, that lies at the interception of the digital, digital transformation and sustainable transitions field further. We also need realistic perspectives and assessments and, and we need to study science and innovation as it happens. And uh, lastly, uh, we need more responsible research and innovation practices and more transformative innovation policies and converging discussions about digitalization, sustainability transitions and just, tresses, just transitions uh, as we are having now. And with that, I will say thank you for listening. Thank you, Daria, Marianne and, and Victor for really fascinating uh, and insightful talks. Um, so we've been provided a really comprehensive uh, overview, I think, of, of the technological uh, changes going on, digitalization, um, and both uh, possibilities uh, as well as risks. And um, it's easy to be pessimistic, um, but now in the, in the debate, um, I would like to, to focus on, on possibilities for change and sort of the, some of the, the, the seeds for, uh, or the potentials for bringing uh, technological change uh, in line with our sustainability uh, challenges or sustainability goals uh, and how we can do that. What are the challenges uh, of, of, of doing that? Um, I want to start with you, uh, Daria, uh, and ask you a question uh, related to your, um, your proposal uh, of using the tools and concepts of environmental governance, which I thought was a really interesting uh, approach, um, to, to manage technological, technological change. So environmental governance um, has, over time, developed quite, uh, quite advanced uh, tools and also, um, in an academic sense, quite advanced concepts um, to understand uh, challenges, uh, change, uh, and sort of the mechanisms of, of bringing things um, uh, further. So, uh, and I, I think it's a, it's a fascinating idea to build on that, those ideas and, and bring that into to, to, uh, to, to digitalization and technological change, um, uh, and op that which opens up for some really interesting, I think, cross fertilization of, 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 of different disciplines. Um, but, but one challenge I see. 
uh, is that in the sector of digitalization, um, there's at the moment a great, what I would call a power imbalance, right? A lot of the, the changes that we see are driven by these technological giants um, that have been mentioned already uh, here today. So uh, while governments, I think, in my view, are kind of uh, struggling a little bit to find the leverage points, find the possibilities for, 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 for controlling uh, the, these larger technological uh, giants, right? So, um, what's your perspective on this? So, I mean, how, what, what's, the, what's the potential for, for governments uh, and also citizens to kind of reinstate democratic control of, of these changes? Yes, thank you, Howard. It's a great question, and obviously, this is what everyone would point out to. Uh, I don't want to be too naive, but at the same time, I want to still play with this idea of uh, having something that is to a certain extent transferable. And I guess here the whole thing is to figure out what are the what are the boundaries, to which extent does it work or doesn't work. And here maybe we could draw on our experience with uh, energy sector and specifically oil and gas. Right? We have powerful oil and gas players in the world. And at some point we said, well, maybe it doesn't exactly work this way for many different reasons. And uh, one big initiative of the European Union has been to, for example, uh, separate upstream, midstream and downstream in uh, energy markets. So one question that we could have is right now, let's say uh, major social networks, they in terms of data control all the three parts, right? Upstream, midstream, downstream. And if that would be prohibited, and if that we, if we would have to disintegrate this, what we have now vertically integrated corporations, how would that look like? Could we do it? And to which extent this parallel would work? Uh, in, in, but by the same token, we found interesting ways, right, of uh, addressing certain sustainability challenges related to uh, transport industry, and this is what I have been previously studying, global shipping, where for a very long time, what we have been doing very actively is putting all the responsibility on shipping companies. And shipping companies would just try to sneak out and find ways how can we maybe do some somewhat less because their business models were not allowing them they were operating in very thin margins until uh there has started some development more on the consumer side right because it's not only the the, the shipping companies should bear all the weight of uh, applying let's say environmental regulation and then lowering the margin. One way of thinking about it is that if consumers are ready to pay a slightly higher price for the goods that they are receiving, that they're being shipped to their destination, then actually the shipping companies have even some money that they can uh, invest into, for example, improving their fleet. And this is what we have seen here in the Baltic Sea region, where consumers were concerned and they well, maybe not the straight out boycotting, but they would be willing to know. Uh, and I'm not necessarily even meaning individual consumers, but we can talk first about the corporate consumers. And uh, big players were some of the Swedish big corporations, IKEA, uh, Volvo, Electrolux. They wanted sustainable uh, procurement. They were looking into how the parts are being delivered, how the goods are being delivered, and here you go, this kind of unrolls how it goes into the final consumer. Uh, so another idea, right? So there are different entry points, actually, in the governance process. And this is why I think governance here is a more broad term than regulation. Mm -hmm. Regulation is still more narrow. and. I do agree that we do have, we face certain problems with regulating tech giants in the traditional regulatory sense. But I think there are more creative approaches to governing 
mm. tech giants. Yeah. But here we need to think a bit, you know, we need to experiment a bit. What what are the things that we already have that could, we could a bit twist and turn and maybe apply? Absolutely. I think, and I think the, uh, the example of oil and gas and oil and gas sector is a, is a really good one. Of course, there we have a history of, at least in the US, of, of breaking up these, these massive value chains. So, of course, w way back in history. Um, but, but, and I, but I also agree with you that, that uh, the, these tech companies present a bit of a different type of challenge at the same time, because I think they are composed in a much more sort of networked way, while you know, Standard Oil was a very well-known company with a very well-known figurehead. Uh, these companies are much more kind of working um, as, as, as kind of networked uh, organizations, it seems to me. So, um, but, but definitely an interesting, um, uh, interesting approach. I want to bring uh, Victor into this. So you, you um, emphasized, um, of course, the sort of ubiquitous nature of, um, of technology on our planet uh, and all the risks um, and, and challenges that come with that. Um, and that's easy to kind of to look at that and hear your presentation and, and get kind of pessimistic about the possibilities for, um, for, for governance, uh, governments, uh, and, and, uh, and, and um, um, citizens to kind of in intervene in that ubiquitous system. But, but, but do you see any, um, any leverage points for, for positive change there? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, and just to follow up, and I think I agree with, completely with what Daria said and and you mentioned something about also asymmetry i think we, sh we should recognize there are different types of asymmetries right so there's an asymmetry between ourselves as consumers and tech companies that is huge they know a lot about you but you know very little about them and then there's also this asymmetry between big tech companies and governments but i think in this in this latter case i think that asymmetry has been uh, a result of, of governments not wanting to step in and regulate mm. in, in the purpose of innovation or this is a growth sector, we, ne we need to allow it to expand, etc. And that may very well be taken back. And I think we're seeing that at the moment, both uh, if we think about GDPR, uh, if we think about the discussed AI regulation for, for EU, um, and the other entry points besides from government is consumers, civil society, and investors. And I think all the same as we see for climate change issues, the same would be for, for, for the tech sector. And that accountability and need to govern is becoming much more clear. So I, I don't see it at all as an issue that these are networked companies. I mean, all multinational companies have been networked for decades. And, um, we, there is a perception that it's digital and therefore it's difficult to grasp. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not the cloud can be regulated. It's hardware, it's information, it's people, it's profits. I mean, all these things can, in principle, be, be regulated and governed. So I'm, I'm not at all pessimistic on the possibilities to actually do it. Okay. Thanks. That, that's, uh, that, that's good to hear. So, uh, Marianne, in a way, you kind of presented the most optimistic picture, in a way. You emphasized these, these possibilities um, in, in the transport mobility sector of using digitalization to drive you know, um, uh, a shift towards more sustainable forms of, of, uh, of transport, which I, I, I agree with you. There are some really exciting possibilities there. Um, what I wanted to, uh, to pick up on there was, was um, I think to make that shift happen, we also need to a certain extent um, change in social norms, right? Um, because some of these, um, you know, car sharing, uh, other types of sort of sharing of technologies to a certain extent um, uh, mean that we have to perhaps get rid of our ideas of, you know, our car uh, is individually owned, uh, et, et cetera. Um, so, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, to what extent do we need um, change in social norms to make this, this transition happen? And, and, and that, is that um, possible? Yes, well, uh, I don't think I <laughs> painted a very optimistic picture. <laughs> I see a lot of challenges there, but... Uh, yeah. Uh, when it comes to social norms, I think also that's one of the hardest things to change. Although you can see from the pandemic that when something is uh, um, 
important and uh, felt as crucial to to do something about we are able to change quite quickly yeah. um but i think uh, changing social norms around the uh, car dependency and uh, and uh, if you're willing to to let go of uh, private privatized uh, transport for instance uh, it's quite challenging to envision that we will be able to do that because it's so much entangled in our culture for instance in uh, norway we live in a country where everyone everyone is uh, uh, cherishing going to their uh, cabin in the weekend and uh, unless we are able to do something with uh, that and provide more tra more shared and uh, public transport solution for that kind of solution I guess it's very hard to change it's just an example to 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 highlight how hard these things are to are to change really yeah, yeah. So, so um, I think one thing that comes across uh, from all these presentations is, um, or something that, that Daria pointed to uh, in her presentation, is that um, a lot of this is, is kind of is, is expert driven. And I'm thinking about what is, again, to this question of what is the, the space for sort of um, you know, bottom down, bottom up um, uh, governance, what is the space for, for citizen mobilization? It seems to me that. Um, that these changes are quite uh, ex ex expert driven and it's hard for people to kind of grasp um, where to, to, to kind of intervene uh, in the system. We participate in a sense as, as providers of uh, our own individual data, but to be citizens in this sort of digitalized, the digitally me mediated society in a broader sense, in a deeper sense than just kind of providing data, is, um, is perhaps a bit harder for people to, to, uh, to see wh where that space is. Um, any thoughts on this, uh, Daria? Or anyone else in the panel? Well, like, wh what's the room? Honest, I, yeah, go, go ahead. To be quite honest, I never really took a deep thought mm -hmm. in this regard, but Again, let me just play a bit with this uh, with this question. Uh, let's ask ourselves about environmental activism and its history. And we usually have seen massive protests or mobilizations around some key events. And then there is just this smaller group of activists who are always there. And uh, we have recently seen certain trends, right, that are the, the trends of veganism, the trends of, you know, using more either biking or kind of sustainable, sustainable or low carbon mobilities, trends. Uh, they are not ubiquitous, but they are still much more present now than they have been even, let's say, 20 years ago. Uh, and uh, if, if I ask myself what really has changed is maybe that all of these things have become just much more easy, there are more choices, let's say, for uh, non-meat eaters. Uh, there are easier choices for those who want to ride a bike in the city and so on and so forth. So in a way, uh, it's always an interaction of us and the environment that is surrounding us. And there are always the pioneers who try to figure out what could be these uh, new intersections. And then there are the adopters. So in a way, once these discussions are really open, and they are opened right now, I think we could expect certain um, movement in the direction of making, uh, let's say, being sustainable online easier mm -hmm. for an average person. Because it should be fairly easy uh, for people to pick up on this and to be willing to, to stick to these routines, right? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, any thoughts on this, Victor or Mariana? Victor? I mean, I, I can just add to that, and I think, uh, Daria, I mean, you, you used the term algorithmic governance in one of your papers. I think there's also uh, a term called algorithmic resistance that I find mm -hmm. very intriguing. So the fact 
So the fact that technologies are ubiquitous, especially digital technologies, the, that means that they become accessible for people at very low costs. And uh, those technologies can be used to mobilize and to resist, if you want to use that word, the, the dominance and applications of certain technologies. And we've seen that very clearly in the US and, and discussions and regulation uh, around facial recognition technologies, uh, to some extent also in the UK. And there's likely to be more, more of those. So crowdsourced uh, data gathering of, of surveillance cameras, for example, already exist. You can find those digitally. Uh, there are ways to use social media ranking algorithms or try to game them in a way to, to uh, advance certain campaigns with social purposes, etc. Uh, but again, it, it's not at all as in the sustainability or climate domain, but I see that emerging also for digitization and, and artificial intelligence and starting to ask the tough questions, like why is this used for whom and, and, and who's benefiting and who's losing out. Yeah. That is happening. Yeah. Mariana, I'm not sure we have, we're seeing the same sort of uh, uh, algorithmic re resistance here in Norway. So we had the smart meter rollout, which was basically without any kind of uh, questioning, uh, almost. Um, do you agree? And, and what do you think that? Why do you think that is? Yeah, uh, and this uh, I think has a lot to do with trust in uh, in Norway. We have a very trustful relationship with our government, uh, government and. Uh, I think that's also uh, that's of course in very many respects uh, uh, a good thing. But uh, when it comes to to what's happening in the digital area, I think we are, it makes us a bit uh, unwary and not so so concerned as we should be. Like uh, when you look into the um, impacts or possible implications of a smart meter rollout, for instance, and uh, the New uh, t new markets uh, around uh, uh, flexibility, for instance, you can clearly see that this is very much tied into inequalities, and uh, that there will be disadvantaged groups. and uh, And uh, I also think, if you're related to the wind uh, energy debate, for instance, it's also show that we are often very late at acting. Uh, uh, from the public uh, side of things, so I'm I'm a bit concerned really that uh, we are falling behind and that uh, we are not taking the anticipatory perspectives. Uh, 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 as we are not regarding this as important as it should be because. Uh, innovations are happening a lot in uh, those, those quite confined spaces and experimentation and piloting and trials are going on in many, many places in society. But uh, there's the social uh, part of these kind of experiments is very underdeveloped often. And uh, uh, so the consequences uh, on the social side of things uh, are often not uh, that uh, investigated or studied or highlighted as they should be and uh, so this is what I when I talked about uh, how the kind of uh, innovation and uh, experiments that go on in society are are already uh, governing to some some extent our future uh, energy and uh, transport systems uh, this is something that concerns me a bit because there's not a lot of participation in these kind of processes. They're also often very limited and uh, very rigorously designed mm. in a way to yeah, confined places like public hearings and this kind of, of uh, things. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so it's a bit concerning. <laughs> I agree. So uh, in my own work, I look at uh, cities and, and technological change in cities and how, and, you know, how smart cities are kind of making claims to, to becoming sustainable. Um, and, and we see a lot of the things that you're talking about that, that it's hard to sort of penetrate for, for citizen um, engagement. Um, and the problem is not that, that you know, governance agents, in this case the municipalities, don't want to include 
uh, citizens is rather that these projects um, are, are come kind of predefined. They have to hit the ground running uh, and, and start the innovation experimentation processes. Uh, and and these, so then there's a very limited room uh, in just in the way that things are set up uh, for, for mm. citizens to, mm. to really be part of, of, uh, uh, of what's going on. They're being asked to, you know, to, to use an app, uh, for example, to choose between three, four, five different te technological designs or, 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 or urban plans. Um, so, so it's a way that's used to kind of inform citizens in, in, in a much better way than it were before. But it's kind of the other way um, of citizens actually changing this, this project is it's much more, uh, much more um, uh, difficult, I think. So, um, so what, what does this mean for, for democracy in, in a broader sense? So, Victor, you want to pick up on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that's such a good observation, and I th see that as a main challenge. I think since the topic here is sustainability, I think many of us in the sustainability domain realize that what we need are deep system changes and transformations. We talk about transformations. The problem with innovation, as I see it, in the digital domain and the AI domain, is that you innovate, first of all, driven in many, many cases by corporate interests. You innovate in areas where there is a lot of data already, and you innovate in areas where there is a clear benefit to be made in reducing some resource, right? It's energy or something else. So the questions we need to ask ourselves as sustainability scientists is, are these the proper incentives to create innovation that create transformation? Or are they just nudging around the same corner, yeah. you know, and just minimizing and optimizing small, small systems. That, that to me is a key, key, and, and that links to democracy, yeah. right? What, what is the place for, sit, for engagement for citizens in innovations that are so corporate driven, so optimizing, so focused on data? It's very difficult. Yeah. Any thoughts on this, uh, Daria? Any algorithmic uh, resistance in Finland? <laughs> Yes, uh, I have colleagues here at the University of Helsinki who are working with this My Data project that is one of the forms of resistance to uh, spread of algorithmic governance. But in a way, um, uh, I, I looked a bit into the topic of algorithmic governance and my, my conclusion is that uh, as we deploy more and more algorithms across various uh, forms and fields of governance, uh, the governance is becoming a bit more algorithmic. So it's not it's not a binary, there is a non-algorithmic governance and then there is an algorithmic governance. But we just infuse a bit more and a bit more of different forms of algorithmization uh, into different forms of governance until we, at some point, I guess, will be there when we will be able to talk about fully-fledged algorithmic governance. So in, in a sense, governance is changing and will not be the same as, as it used to be, whether we're talking about automatic speed cameras or we are talking about, um, about the social sharing now um, happening into very different uh, forms than before. Yes, I'm not asking my neighbor whether they can give me a lift. I'm using their uh, the, the Uber application or, or some other application. So in, in this regard, Things have changed. I'm not asking my cousin if they could uh, help assemble me a piece of furniture. I have an app for that as well. Uh, so basically, we are changing as a society and the ways how we relate to each other. And I guess this particularly, so the, because we are, uh, our experiences become more and more mediated. Mm. This in a way, change, this maybe doesn't change us like as humans, but there definitely changes the relational structure in the society. And these forms of political practices that we used to have, they were not meant for the societies that are in this different way mediated. So I guess it does pose actually big questions for democracy. I don't see it. Uh, I guess this, Howard, what you said about 
uh, mobilization and protest and how can we organize vis-a-vis -vis the big tech companies. Uh, it, it's, it's a good question, but it's still even thinking in the old terms. I guess the question is even is even deeper and, and, and unfortunately bigger. What does democracy mean in uh, in, in this in, in this society where we relate to each other in a different way. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and democracy. And I'm, I'm concerned about democracy and, and how democ what these changes, uh, the fact that we're becoming more and more digitally mediated, as you say, our relationships are becoming more, more and more digitally mediated. I mean, what, what that means for, for, for democracy. I mean, democracy, you know, as an old idea, comes from a certain kind of territorial boundary within this country. We, we are a people and, uh, and we are going to govern ourselves in, within here and we vote. And, and, um, and to make that happen in a good way, we need uh, a certain sort of national conversation about where we are headed as, as a polity. Um, now that all of that is changing and, and uh, we, uh, of course, a big part of this that we haven't touched upon um, so far, that I have been kind of, uh, well, not kind of, but very preoccupied with the past couple of years, is, is the rise of, uh, uh, of populism. These political movements that are challenging the basis of our institutions, um, claiming that they are um, illegitimate. And, of course, as you know, a big part of the explanation for uh, and that academics and others are using to, to, to explain the rise of these populist movements is the fact that we are now communicating much less uh, in, in a coherent, socially coherent way, but in these kind of uh, bubbles or um, yeah, uh, certain trenches, if you will, uh, where you, or echo chambers where, where um, um, there's no, there's no um, mechanisms to sort of uh, check the facts uh, or, or, or critique uh, people's opinions. It's rather a reinforcement of people's biases, um, uh, etc. So, but again, back to this question of Hannah, I mean, is that a good um, diagnosis of, of the state of our democracy? Uh, do you agree with that uh, diagnosis? And how do we kind of move out of it? Big question. <laughs> <laughs> Start, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think uh, it's a good uh, diagnosis, and uh, uh, I think it's even more concerning that the sustainability crisis and the justice crisis that we see are actually reinforcing the, this. Uh, the democr democratization crisis in a way so that uh, we are creating more and more uh, inequalities uh, as as we try to tackle the, the sustainability and climate problem we are we are creating more and more actually losers and winners even the winners are are getting uh, in a way more adva uh, advantages uh, and uh, this, of course, has to, I suppose, uh, has to do with the nations, but also uh, geographically, if you look at the global uh, scale, I think that's uh, it's, uh, even more concerning in a way. Mm. Yeah. Maria, thoughts or Victor? Well, this is indeed a very big question. How do we get out of here? <laughs> where we got ourselves into and uh, I guess well the answer is there are no simple answers right there is there are no one fit all solutions but at the same time I guess the, the first recipe or at least this this is my personal recipe is we shouldn't uh, fade in despair and lose hope mm. so first of all we should always remember that it's us right mm. we are doing all of this and we can also do differently and this actorness that we possess i guess should be a major motivator for us to be hopeful and to have a positive outlook of the future because i guess very often the discussion is somehow depersonalized right there are some faceless and nameless entities uh and especially now when we are talking about new and emerging technologies, because they are 
unknown, they are unfamiliar, and most people don't understand how they work, it feels like they are almost autonomous and they are endangering us. But we should never forget that we are creating them. We are the the agents who have actually come up with the whole idea of, let's say, artificial intelligence. We are feeding the data into the algorithms. We are writing the algorithms. We are rewriting them. We are deciding where they are supposed to be deployed. Uh, and we still have institutions. We still have checks and balances. We have regulatory systems. We have legal systems. We have courts. We have a lot of things in place that could help us navigate in this very delicate situation as long as we just remind ourselves that we are the actors here. We are not um, the victims of some mysterious process. It's not an asteroid falling on us and we just, you know, like in the big Hollywood movies. We are creating this with our own hands and our own brains. And we are responsible for how it's going to be deployed and uh, how, and, and of course, there are many unintended consequences. And as we go, we should somehow adapt and um, mm, try to steer it. So this is why I'm saying this is the question of governance. We very much need to see uh, wh where do we want to be. And uh, we need an open discussion of how to get there. You ended... Um uh, one of your last slides, you had uh, you put up the SDG goals, and I think maybe all three of you uh, put up the SDG goals, uh, which is one example of sort of a collective action at, at the global scale, right? Which you could say it's flawed in many ways, but at the same time uh, impressive to have that kind of collective action. And you can mention uh, the Paris Agreement on climate change as, as, a, as a similar type of, of governance um, accomplishment. Uh, anyway, so, so I think you, you are right. I mean, we are also, we're not just sort of victims of, of this, 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 this massive avalanche of changes going on. It's also, there's also room for, um, uh, there's, there's also examples of how we manage to, to, to act collectively, uh, in, uh, however, in uh, imperfect ways. Um, Victor, do you have any thoughts on this? I mean, in what sense are these? So the SDGs and Paris Agreement and these sort of global collective action um, achievements, if you want to call them that, uh, part of the solution? Or... I mean, I, I think they're, they're key because, because they offer like a, a corridor of action across many, many issues for, for the global community. I think they are key. Then, the, of course, the challenge is how do we make this happen uh, in, in the real world and materialize and not just end up as ambitious uh, goals that we never never achieve. But then the, the other question is, since we are talking about digitization, uh, like how, how can we use digital tools to achieve these goals in a way that are inspiring to people, that build social capital, that build empathy, uh, etc. I think we're, we're it's challenging, and I don't think we're there yet. Mm -hmm. But, but to me, that would be the exciting questions to ask. Yeah. yeah. So, wh how would you answer that question if I <laughs> asked it to you? I mean, do you see any? Uh, <laughs> what is it? Of course, not in a broad sense. But do you see any seeds or examples of this happening? I mean, the, so maybe two two positive seeds and then one boundary condition. I mean, one is the fact that we are seeing much better self-regulation by digital platforms related to mis- and disinformation. I think that took off late, but it did. So we think, think about Twitter, Facebook, etc. now filtering out mm -hmm. problematic information to a bigger extent than before. I find that hopeful. Another thing that I find hopeful is the fact that people that actually share fake news or disinformation, misinformation, is older people, not younger people. Younger people are much more savvy in the way they use and talk about news online. So maybe there's a demographic force here that will help us. Uh, and then the last point is that we, may, we shouldn't put all emphasis on only digital tools and, and social media and, and see that as a fix for democracy. Uh, this is a much bigger topic. It's about the whole media landscape, uh, not just social media. And then other issues like social issues, social inequality, 
being able to have leaders that are able to to tell a narrative or where we want to go uh, rather than just presenting facts, for example. Yes, if I could add to that, I think this is also uh, where I think constructive social science and humanities have a role to play and uh, something to offer and uh, and uh, so it means uh, we were talking a lot about uh, a little bit this topic about the, the innovations but i think uh, going away and breaking out of this uh, conventional often restrictive division of labor that we have between the uh, innovation and technology sciences and the uh, development of technology on the one hand and the assessment on the other. I think uh, humanities and social scientists have a lot to offer and uh, new modes of uh, collaboration with, with technologists is, is also some of the ways of, uh, of uh, getting out of this. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, concepts that, has, that are unappreciated uh, so far that comes from the social sciences and the humanities that can be built into this kind of uh, scenarios and uh, also help technologists and the architects um, increase the resilience and the robustness of their thinking uh, and planning. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think there's uh, something to thinking about the more epistemic justice and uh, how we can collaborate across different disciplines is also a way of of uh, moving towards a more optimistic route after this. <laughs> I agree and, and thanks for bringing us on to that, uh, that, that theme of the role of research and role of academics which I think is uh, it's a really important one and um, I'm sure you, you've experienced the same thing as a social scientist um, I experience in increasingly being sort of drawn into these collaborations um, with people from other disciplines, at least partly, I think, because the funders <laughs> demand it of them, that they, they bring us on board. But I think also it's because um, they see that we have something to, to offer, to, um, to bring in some sort of uh, insight and critical perspectives on these, these larger uh, societal processes of societal change. But um, I want to go back to you, Daria. So you, um, you you said that you um, um, that, that this is a kind of an emerging field for you, uh, and that uh, um, you're using this opportunity to, um, um, to to bring up some questions that you are kind of uh, moving your research and your your, your thinking into. Um, so how do you kind of uh, how do you approach this vast field um, through research i mean what are the entry points there what what are the uh, uh, the questions that can be you know addressed with the tools that we as social scientists have at our disposal right yes as i mentioned this is a this is a new field for me but it's also n not so new or at least this is how I see it. And the reason for that is that I have uh, more than 10 years of experience in studying environmental uh, policy and governance and uh, very similar to what Marianne is doing. I did a lot on transportation and energy and uh, ports and uh, ships and uh, all these large infrastructures and uh, basically Hearing these discussions, looking into these cases, uh, accumulating expertise on those, and then by virtue of various circumstances, I got more and more in touch with uh, with people who are looking into media and digitalization. And this is when it struck me that they are talking about very similar issues, but they just don't have this background in environmental policy and governance. They don't really know these discussions that we have been having in our discipline and building upon even longer tradition. And this is where it got very interesting to me to start building some parallels and bridges and see how far can I stretch these metaphors, these tools, these ways of thinking, these concepts. Uh, in, in, and, and then I actually arrived there where, where Victor started his presentation today, that it's very useful to think about the technosphere or what I would call the infosphere surrounding us 
uh, in a similar way as a biosphere and also see how the two intertwine because they are mutually reinforcing and because obviously our technosphere depends on our biosphere. And so in a way, uh, by seeing our living environment as, uh, as just extended, it has always been com com made of natural and, and artificial or technological components, but now it just has become so obvious uh, the, the interconnectedness of the two and the great importance of the two uh, living environments and how they are actually blending into one environment that is a precondition for our well-being and thriving. For me, the question comes, how do we govern this complexity, all of this, in, in, in a sound way? And obviously there is, as I already mentioned, no simple fixes, no one size fits all solutions. But there can be some interesting interdisciplinary work that can be done, especially starting from very simple transfer of concepts. Something that is very well known in one field, we take it out of its context, place into a new context, and then we can learn something in this way. It's a very standard method in a way, but uh, it does require some time, some thinking, some, you know, be, being creative and definitely, definitely conversing with other scholars in the seminar is one of those rare opportunities to actually do exactly this this time of this type of back and forth this time of collective collective thinking collective intelligence exercises mm. so uh victor and marianne my my impression of uh, the institutions that you that, that you come from stockholm resilience center and, uh, and and tnu is that they're both um institutions with a lot of uh, that have come quite far in terms of uh, interdisciplinary work uh, and research that kind of um uh, addresses societal challenges in a kind of in, in, in a clear and quite policy relevant way. So, uh, sort of a f as a final question to to each of you, I wanted to uh, give you a chance to maybe to, to 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 give some some tips to Daria uh, going into this field um, or deeper into this field of, of sort of how how to uh, how to um, to uh, develop research. Uh, in a way where, where, where the academic contribution to, to these societal challenges is, is, uh, is clear and it's, it, it's implemented uh, in a way, if that's, if that's a clear enough of a question. Mm. Victor, if you want to go first. Yeah, of course. Um, I, I think what, what I find very useful and my colleagues find useful, because we're, we are, as you mentioned, a multi-transdisciplinary center, is start, start with the phenomena that you want to investigate, put that at the center rather than a theory, and then add and communicate with, with competencies that help you understand that phenomena, whether it's another discipline or maybe an expert that works in practice to, to unpack it in a creative way. And for the longer term, uh, think about building strong relationships and social capital with people that are give you good energy and that are willing to learn and explore together with you. And then the rest will follow. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, Mariana. Well, I think uh, Daria has an excellent um, starting point. Coming from uh, governance, I think it's a very strong uh, background to have when you go into these types of questions and collaborations. And also it's something that uh, often is is uh, very uh, vague for uh, people working more in technology. But I, I feel like being in a university where we focus very much on trans and trans and interdisciplinarity, I would say, and uh, the and um, particular challenges uh, in this area. Um, I guess you have already discovered this, but I think it's uh, patience is one of the things that we really need. And uh, I think it's uh, being able to tra translate what uh, we as social sciences and humanities are, uh, are looking into. I think it's uh, something that is valuable for 
us on the SSH side, but it's equally important for the technologists and the others in other domains. And I, my my experience is that when talking to people in the practice field, they very easily grasp the kind of problems and challenges that we see. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I'm optimistic <laughs> when it comes to how it this will pan out. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I, if I can add, uh, so I also work at the Center for Climate and Energy Transformation here at the University of Bergen, where we have um, a similar type of ambition to be both um, socially and politically uh, relevant and to try to use our research in a way that, or, or design uh, and conduct our research in a way that, that kind of uh, informs directly these, uh, these, these, societal, um, these societal challenges. And I think in my, my experience of, of working with that um, is that, as you say, uh, expose yourself to, um, to different disciplines is key, but also to try to bring uh, societal actors on board uh, in projects. Uh, as a social scientist, we, I think uh, one um, common uh, method for us has, has long been to to interview people and then come back to the office and, and, and write up our reports and papers. But, but, um, but we've had some projects where we try to really engage the social science, uh, the, um, so, uh, society, societal stakeholders within projects, try to understand the problem that we're addressing from their point of view in a much, in, in a much deeper sense, um, which has taught us a lot, I think, about um, research and what are the good questions, what are the accurate questions, um, etc. But unfortunately, we have to draw this uh, to a close. I want to thank you, uh, Daria Genschenko, Viktor Galas, and Marianne Righeug for uh, excellent presentations uh, and really uh, thoughtful uh, interventions as part of this, um, part of this discussion. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and special thanks to, to Daria Grishenko. Congratulations again uh, on your uh, Nils Klim uh, Prize. And we really look forward to, uh, to following your work uh, in the future. So thanks a lot to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.